Um, so we start then, uh, first of all, with uh, real with, uh, Neil, sorry, Neil Rothney, who uh, has um, spent much of his life in the oil industry, has a, a considerable range of experience, which I, um, yeah, um, which I've read all about recently, actually, and and was very impressed with. But um, we're, I think, we'll keep things short. And um, after Neil has spoken, then Pete Connell, who was a founder member of um, Scotty Three, will will follow him and speak for maybe ten minutes or so. Um, and then after that, we'll move on to the panel of speakers from the different groups. Okay, so um, Neil, is that is that okay with you? Can I? Yeah. Hand so over. Thank you. Uh, I did specifically ask Evelyn to mention my good looks when she introduced me. Uh, sorry, I totally forgot. I got... <laughs> we have discussed this before and, and acknowledged that. So um, so pleased to have it as taken. Yes. <clears throat> well, the reality is I'm probably uh, Scott E3's youngest member. So that's probably why I got the gig. Um, <laughs> yeah. 40 years I spent on oil rigs, and I mean, it does beg the question, what would you necessarily know about the oil industry? 40 years on an oil rig, it's, you know, it's not in itself, uh, 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 you know, it's not in itself uh, a qualification, but it, it does give me a, a different sort of view of the oil industry. It's the, the oil industry for me, of course, is absolutely and utterly concrete. It's where I've spent most of my life, I, I know it very well, the, the nuts and bolts, you know, the, the rigs, the, the men, the, the way it works. Um, and why that's important, I think, is because um, since I've become involved with the climate justice movement, I mean, inspired by Extinction Rebellion, I mean, one of the, the issues that has constantly been there for me is that the, the oil industry, it, it has been viewed to a large extent, for, for a large part of that time, it was viewed as a sort of concept. I mean, it, it was understood that fossil fuels are uh, at the root of the, the climate crisis. And of course, um, the climate crisis, although this meeting is about, is about uh, the cost of living crisis in the North Sea, I mean, if we're not <laughs> talking about the climate crisis, we're really not putting anything into its context today. We're not really talking about the real world. And and the, you know, the fossil fuels are, a, it's, a, it's a concept, it's, it's rather abstract. I mean, where we need to get the conversation, and I think Juan will know this, he took the, the Scottish climate camp up to Aberdeen, where we need to put the conversation is firmly into the, 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 the real world, and that's the world where North Sea gas is uh, driving a, a crisis of the cost of living crisis and threatening to destroy lives. It's a destroying lives already. And um, so, um, I mean, I, I mentioned the climate crisis, but as I say, because you, you can't avoid it. It, it. Otherwise nothing makes much sense. And the, I mean, the short version is that, that if we keep drilling for oil and gas, then and keep burning it, then we really are sunk. Um, I don't think there's, I, I don't know who the audience is here today, but I don't think there's going to be much uh, uh, disagreement with that. And if there is, it can be raised in the discussion. The, <clears throat> the, the North Sea, the, the plan, the oil company plan for the North Sea has is, is got a name. It's called uh, Maximise Economic Recovery, and it is pretty much as it says. It's, it's about taking every single drop of hydrocarbons out of the North Sea. It's, uh, it's written into law, and it's existed since way before COP. I mean, it, it COP was slightly surreal. They, they, they talked about uh, uh, cutting emissions, and, and yet it was done with, a, with this policy in place. And you can be assured that if maximizing economic recovery of hydrocarbons is the policy on the North Sea, then it's the policy of the oil industry everywhere. So since we, we, we uh, proposed the meeting, there have been a couple of changes. I mean, there are, are, are a couple of new things have happened. I mean, obviously, firstly, the, uh, the election of, of Liz Truss, and, and uh, she has come out and uh, confirmed the enormity of the cost of living crisis in a pretty spectacular fashion by 
by throwing, well, we don't know how much, but somewhere in the region of 130 billion pounds at this problem. Uh, money she's going to borrow in our name and, and make us pay back, presumably. Uh, the, the, her fantasy, the fantasy is that she's going to grow the economy to pay for this. But the, the madness is that she thinks that uh, she's going to do this by being cheerleader for the oil and gas industry and, and ramping up gas and oil production, despite the fact that there is absolutely no way, no proof and no way that uh, th th this can be done quickly that even if it is done, that it will affect the cost of living, that you can reduce the prices. Um, my, my own opinion is that eventually they will try to make the people pay. In a sense, we have a, a, a hiatus here. We have a, a slight pause. I mean, if we, if we uh, look at the, the plan, the plan was that uh, there was going to be another hike in the cap the, the uh, limit on the, the bills that people pay for energy and that, uh, and that uh, oh, I've lost my place here. Anyway, um, this obviously is not going to be some sort of definitive analysis of the cost of living crisis, but it, it is going to start by responding to a couple of the big lies that, are, that have been uh, pushed around in this, in this last period. And I mean, it, households are facing a steep increase in their energy prices due to supply and demand on the global wholesale market. And this has driven up the amount providers pay for gas and electricity, and that cost is now being passed on to the consumer. Well, I took that quote from a BBC web page, and there may well be uh, such thing as a global wholesale market for energy, but this in no way explains why there have been huge increases in energy bills for consumers in the UK. There is no global market uh, that North Sea gas could realistically be part of. Um, North, you know, there are no pipelines anywhere else other than Europe. Well, there are pipelines to Kazakhstan, that is true. Uh, but but the gas, you know, the pipeline from Kazakhstan is full of gas coming the other way. Kazakhstan does not need North Sea gas. Um, the, you, you can't liquefy North Sea gas and, and send it around the world. I mean, we don't have the facilities to do this and we don't have the fleet of tankers to send it. So uh, even if there were desperate potential gas buyers in India and in China, uh, assuming that they exist, they can't get hold of North Sea gas. They can't bid the price up that we are being paced, forced to pay for this. It's just not possible. There is not a market in the way that most of us think of markets. You know, somebody comes to a table in a square and takes seven apples and eight people turn up and you think, oh, the price of apples is going to be high today and somebody's not going to get an apple. It, it's not like that. The, the other big lie is that the, the, the root of this crisis is purely down to the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Well, you know, the, the prices began to rise, wholesale gas prices began to rise way, way before the, the, the war in, in, in Ukraine. And the majority of our gas, something around 90% of the, the domestic gas, the gas we, that we use in this country comes from the North Sea. That's from the British and the Norwegian sectors. Um, I mean, there is no difference between the British and the Norwegian sector. I mean, there is an imaginary line between them, but it's the same gas coming from the same, the same geographical entity and with roughly the same cost of production. And, and there has been no significant cost of production, uh, increase in, in, in gas production from the North Sea. I, I, by chance, I happen to know uh, Professor Alex Kemp, we used to drink in the same pub in Aberdeen many years ago. And he's the, he's the man who, who wrote the official history of uh, North, the North Sea gas industry. And you know he's confirmed this, that, that there, there has been no significant increase in the cost of gas production. 
So there, there we have, you know, that, that's not an analysis of the situation. I can't explain the gas markets. They're, they're, they're very, very complicated. Uh, they do include uh, hedge fund speculators. And my guess is that they are part of the reason. But we don't really have to look very far before we see one of the major reasons for, for uh, the, the cost of living crisis dr driven by gas. The big four North Sea gas producers, Total, Shell, BP and Equinor, they made 74 billion pound in profits between them in the first half of this year. And, and although, you know, all, these profits weren't all generated by, by North Sea gas, it's, it's not coincidental that, that, that this is happening. Yeah. Profiteering is, lies at the root of the, the cost of living crisis. So, I mean, I think the 130 billion pounds or whatever it turns out to be that the, the government is borrowing on our behalf gives a, a pretty clear idea of the size of the threat that we're living under. Uh, it's a sum of money that was going to be extracted from the population through periodic hikes in the retail price caps that started way back in 2021 and was meant to be ramped up considerably in October. Well, they've scrapped that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of, of the, the various uh, increases in the cap. Everybody here, well, if, if we, can, we can talk about them later. But, I mean, the effects are, 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 are startlingly clear. I mean, the economies of the poorest and the most vulnerable, those with special needs, uh, they, they're stretched to the limits by the price hike that have already taken place. And, and they would have been completely and utterly wrecked had this October price rise gone ahead. I mean, Trust was utterly silent during our campaign. And it was, it was you know, it, it became very clear that she had absolutely no uh, reason or, or uh, intention of, of uh, dealing with this. But obviously, reality or sense has prevailed. I mean, there was a huge outcry from the energy providers who said, well, people are not going to pay. People can't pay. And the people who can are not going to pay. It's just not going to happen. So I, I think that the trust decision to, to freeze the bills, they, they think, for the next two years, is, uh, although £130 billion doesn't quite explain that, it cost them £35 billion to provide something like 80% relief with the Johnson government, 130 billion does not freeze the prices for two years on that mathematics. But I think everybody is very clear that they can't, they're not in a position where they can lumber the people with these massive costs, this massive cost of living uh, increase. But there's nothing sure of, somebody has to pay for it. And the likelihood is that it's going to be us. Um, I, I wanted to go to the, I'm looking at the time, how am I doing? Anyway, um, I wanted to go, there's, there's one particular part of the community where I live on the south side of Glasgow that are, are really facing a perfect storm at the moment. Um, it embodies really all the various parts of the equation that I've kind of haltingly tried to spell out sketchily. And I think that the, it's worth taking a look at the situation. I mean, the, the, these people are, are people of Pakistani heritage living in, in Govan Hill and Pollock Shields. And they've been watching as their families, friends, and erstwhile neighbors in about a third of the districts and 12% of the land surface of Pakistan have been devastated by floods, which even the government of Pakistan recognizes are a, a direct result of global warming, uh, driving by, driven by fossil fuel burning. So, I mean, 
while trying to raise aid for the victims in Pakistan, this part of our community are facing their own fossil fuel induced crisis. The, the, their cost of living is, has shot up recently. It's driven by the very same uh, fossil fuel fuels that are driving the, the global warming. This, this is a, a confluence of, of you know, the, the general crisis of, of, of uh, uh, global warming and the particular circumstances in the UK where our particular fossil fuel, North Sea gas, is driving a cost of living which, which these people cannot afford. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the situation here where we are facing a, a major, major struggle. And I'm looking at who in society has risen to the struggle so far. And it has got to be said that the, the climate justice movement, uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Just Stop Oil, uh, Climate Camp Scotland, uh, the, 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 the uh, Stop Campbell. Here, we, we've, we've seen uh, the methods of, of, of nonviolent direct action. Uh, the, the, these energetic, in the main, young people have brought the struggles onto the street in front of everyone. And my, my own feeling is that if we are going to, uh, okay, thanks. <clears throat> if we are going to confront the, the cost of living crisis, it's, it's at once an enormous challenge, but it's also an enormous opportunity. When I look at the, 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 the Pakistani community, I wonder why the, the climate justice movement has not rallied to the, to the cause of the people of Pakistan and supported the local communities here to, to publicize and to, uh, you know, to develop the arguments, to demand of the British government that they take their responsibilities seriously and to begin to think about how we can, we can begin to um, intervene and support uh, local communities who are going to be faced with enormous challenges. I think the challenges that they're going to be facing, well, they already are facing. The challenges are to stay warm in the winter and to stay fed when there's a huge um, ask on your diminishing resources. So, I mean, okay, one minute. Um, <coughs> I, th I think that's really basically all that, that, that I want to see. I know that's all been a bit disjo disjointed, but uh, I think that there are major questions raised about the cost of living crisis and how we confront it. And I think that the climate justice movement must see itself absolutely firmly at the center of that. And of course, this is a public meeting and not a, a lecture. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's from this point that I'm hoping that we'll see some discussion on these issues. Anyway, thanks for giving me your time. Uh, thanks very much, Neil. That, that's great. Um, yes, some, uh, some silent applause there for you. Uh, I'll join in. Um, thank you. Um, and um, so, now, Pete, did you want to just pick up from there now? Yeah, okay. Um, it's good to see quite a lot of people here and um, um, I, I just want to briefly add and develop one or two things that Neil said before we go into wider discussion. Um, I mean one of the, the things that certainly made me think about uh, holding this meeting when we were discussing it a few weeks ago was uh, the, the response of other people that I talk to in the climate movement about cost of living, which I think everybody's taken seriously, but has tended to be around the kinds of things that we should be doing that could make a difference. And, and they're important things like uh, retrofitting home insulation and things like that. But in a way, what I would like to just focus on is, uh, if you like, the kind of bigger kind of political thrust of, of what the cost of living and its connection to North Sea oil and gas tells us, uh, which is in no way to diminish the importance of those those practical things as well. 
So, I mean, one one of the things that I, I think we have mm. to bear in mind is that the UK as a whole and Scotland within it is unusually dependent in uh, world terms, actually, on gas for heat. Um, the only European country that's anything similar is the Netherlands, I think. <clears throat> and in England, of course, quite a lot of electricity is produced by gas fired power stations as well. So you know, overall gas plays a really, really important role. And that's why we're so hard hit when prices rise. Now, I mean, Neil talked a bit about this, but I think it's just worth emphasizing that, you know, unstable oil and gas prices are not new. That's been uh, essentially, you know, the story for the last 50 plus years. There's been massive peaks and troughs. Um, I, it's funny how the, the most recent trough has been kind of almost forgotten about. I mean, uh, it's only a few months ago that newspapers were talking about how will the North Sea survive because the price, the, the kind of set price had gone negative for a very short time. So, you know, in principle, they would pay you to take oil and gas. I mean, it didn't last for very long, but th there was a sustained period of very low prices. Prices at which, uh, you know, the economics of production in the North Sea would, didn't add up at all. Actually, they would have been losing money hand over fist at those kind of those prices. Mm -hmm. now, so that market price, uh, the price that, you know, um, the, is, is set as the kind of benchmark, goes up and down enormously. Um, and it's something that, I mean, it's interesting if you just listen to what Liz Truss and people like her say, it's as if God declared that price and in tablets of stone. And once it's there, it's, it's fixed and has to be observed. Um, it's just nonsense and there's loads of examples around the world now and historically of states fixing different prices as well generally lower than the market price okay and that could happen now it could happen here but uh the new government has just chosen not to do that um okay um so you know in a sense you know if you're looking at this through the lens of the UK, it's a bit different in in Germany because in Germany there is a, a problem with supply because their pipelines mostly come from from Russia, and some of them are switched off. And there is going to be they, they actually have a lot more gas storage than we do, but um, but nevertheless there's a problem with supply. In the UK, it's entirely a problem, a crisis of of price, and it's driven by dogma. But and I don't think this is a, a necessarily a good thing, but what it does do is it exposes in really stark terms the connection between the North Sea, North Sea oil and gas, you know, which is, provides almost the entirety of what we use for heat um, in a very, very clear way. Um, and you know, essentially, it's not the case that we're waiting on some deliveries from Russia that are not there or something like that. <clears throat> the the gas we use is generated on the North Sea. It comes through pipelines you know, onshore in Scotland at St Fergus. It's processed. It goes into the the gas grid, and when you turn on the tap on your gas cooker or your gas boiler, you know that is essentially this is a, it's oversimplifying slightly, but it's essentially you know a continuous flow from one to the other, and if it was stopped at source, we would have, we would have a problem with supply, but but the problem is is that uh, what we're being asked to pay for stuff which Neil said it is you know, cost pretty much the same to produce now as it did three years ago, is that's the real issue, and and you can't and if I was an artist I think I'd like to you, you, there's a kind of two way thing here there's the gas flowing in one direction, and there's a a kind of vacuum cleaner sucking money in the opposite direction out of our pockets um, uh, and which heads directly to the the big oil and gas companies and the hedge funds that, that own shares and the licenses to, to the North Sea. Um, 
And that's really, really, I do think, I think lots of people have seen that connection. And I think it's one that um, when we've talked about North Sea oil and gas in the past, has not always, always been clear. Gas has been something that just kind of, it happens in some mysterious way. You know, it's a real material thing. And so it tells us something about really, I think, what we need to do um, both now and in the longer term. Uh, because the now is quite simply around the cost of living crisis. I, mean, I think it's an open question whether they'll have done enough. I, don't, I have my doubts as to what, you know, many, many, many people are still going to be in really serious problems this winter, despite the uh, lack of this, the, uh, you know, the, the, the not such large rise. But uh, what we've also seen is, you know, that then condemns us to high prices for the foreseeable future, because we'll be paying back this vast amount of money over time. Um, and, but there's another, but, and less talked about, kind of connection between the North Sea as well. Because as Neil says, uh, Scottish government, the UK government, okay, thanks, Evelyn, and uh, sadly, some of the unions are signed up to what's uh, called the North Sea transition deal. And it's not at all about transition, it's about continuing production. But it isn't just about oil and gas production, it shapes what options are on the table in UK policy and what are not. So hydrogen's on the table. Hydrogen has a place in the transition, but it's vastly expensive and inefficient if it's used for, for home heating. Um, nuclear's on the table because it preserves those hierarchies of uh, centralization and power that the, that the energy industry has been used to over the last, last hundred years. Um, and, and that for me, I think, sends the message that, you know, there's a direct financial message that we're, we're giving 130 or whatever number of billions of pounds to, to the big oil companies now. They've had net 250 billion from us over, over the last 50 years. Uh, so, you know, they've had, they've had enormous levels of subsidy, which are now continuing. And all at the kind of behest of a kind of market dogma. Um, and, you know, if we're going to really tackle this, then, you know, simply kind of taking the distribution companies into public ownership is not going to do anything at all. We need to tackle it at root and take the, um, the production on the North Sea into public ownership. And I think that's important, not just for the cost of living crisis, but also for the future of actually a transition away to sustainable energy. Because until we do that, there is no real evidence that, um, that the oil and gas companies are, are seriously in, involved in that transition. They want to keep on producing oil and gas for as long, long as they can. And they'll pursue kind of greenwashing solutions like carbon capture and storage, saying that that will allow them to reach what they call a net zero oil production basin you know bizarre combination of words really so i just to just to finish i i, I my my conclusion is that you know we need to be thinking really hard and i hope we can do this in the rest of the discussion about about immediate things around the cost of living crisis but i think we've also got to keep in our minds and in our discussions and and popularize this if we can't popularize it now when would we ever be able to do it popularize the idea that North Sea oil and gas is a problem and but it's actually we've got some ideas about how we can phase it down quite quickly replace all that vast amount of subsidy going into renewables would make an enormous difference you know in a very short space of time and we can do it so I'll stop there okay thank you very much Pete um so I think we're just, uh, I think we're doing okay for time. So um, well, I'll take advantage while that's the case um, before I get too distracted. Uh, so I think if we move on straight away, according to our, our plan to get some feedback, some comments from 
the three uh, panel members. Um, if we could start with um, Wum from the uh, climate camp, if you've got five minutes, uh, if you'd yeah. like to uh, say something about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys, and uh, thanks, Evelyn, and good to see so many faces. And I have to say, um, it's really refreshing to hear talks about something else than the bloody monarchy. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, yeah, like my name's Wung. I'm from Climate Camp Scotland. We held a climate camp just like a month ago um, up north in Aberdeen in the area of Torrey, where we um, like like trespassed with the entire camp on an area that was supposed to go to the uh, fossil fuel industry, um, taking away the glass green space and erecting an energy transition zone for the fossil fuel industry. And we um, committed mass trespass, mass civil disobedience um, with over 100 people into the Aberdeen City Harbour um, at that time and with smaller acts of vandalism to accompany that. Um, so that's kind of like where I'm coming from. And um, I don't really um, have loads to add because you two talked about quite a lot of important things. Um, one thing, I'm going to talk about the monarchy anyways, right? Because um, as you might have noticed, our leaders have been absent all summer, like par UK Parliament has been suspended for months and months, not doing anything. And now they're going on break again because this they use this uh, passing of the Queen to fabricate this myth building exercise while there is a cost of living crisis on, an energy crisis on. And uh, like we just passed a massive heat wave that killed people in England, in Wales, in Portugal, in Spain. Um, so we have so many massive crises and our leaders have nothing else to do than to just like go away and shake hands for like yet another 10 days and with all legislation um like suspended and i'm just saying that because they the, our leaders don't deserve our respect they don't deserve our politeness and they don't take us seriously unless they're forced to do so um unless we go out on strike um, unless we disrupt business as usual. And that's what needs to happen in the next coming months, weeks and years. Um, otherwise, um, there will not be progress. There will just be more stalling and myth building and gaslighting coming from our leaders. And I think, yeah, Pete, Neil, you covered almost everything, but you should be less polite about things. And that goes for all of us. I think we should practice disrespecting our leaders because they don't respect us. Um, the other thing I really liked what you guys said is that this is a housing crisis. Um, as yeah, as you might remember, the British public suddenly doesn't remember anymore, but we had a massive heat wave um, that melted train lines, um, killed people in England um, and across Europe. Um, and yeah, and that is caused by bad housing. And same in this winter, um, people will not be able to afford to heat. And that the root cause of that is bad housing because the UK has set up a system that is dependent on corporate landlords so much that we can't afford to fix these things. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of like what we need to do um, to tackle, to like provide good housing, decent housing for everyone. And if we don't have that, we can't, we can neither address the cost of living crisis nor the effects of the climate crisis that is coming for us all. And um, yeah, I actually wanted to say something more about like um, strikes in the oil and gas sector. Um, I don't know whether I still have time. Maybe I'll end on that. Um, so currently there's also um, um, a couple of strikes happening, wildcat strikes in the oil and gas sector, both in Grangemouth and Osmoran, and two of the biggest polluters across the central belt in Scotland. And um, we are trying to support them, um, but we are kind of like reluctant because despite a lot of like commonality, there's a lot of differences and a lot of like, mistrust between uh, workers and climate activists still in the sector. So that is something that you guys from Scott A3 can really, really help us with, to build ties with them, to like connect us with them, to see where the commonalities, where the differences that we have to bridge. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll end on that. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Wumi, that's, that's brilliant. Um, well timed. Uh, so uh, our next speaker then um, is um, Zareen from the Muslim Women's Association of Edinburgh. Um, I can't see you now, Zareen, if you could, maybe I'm on the wrong page at this point. You can't see me? Oh, there you are. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> hi. hi, everyone. Yeah. Hello. Um, so um, Muslim Women's Association works with the community. So we're the ones who um, would be aware of the refugees coming into the city and uh, what kind of things uh, they need. 
And every crisis, we're uh, looking after people who can't afford their rents, are in threat of being evicted. And it just seems like it's got worse and worse. Um, people on universal credit not being able to afford uh, like the cost of living now. And if it's going to go up, where is that going to leave, leave everyone? So um, it's all very well to have a lovely community to lean on in these times. But I've been very frustrated that um, with the increase in food banks and everything over the last decade, that we haven't been able to tap into. If people are so generous and they're given food banks and we know, we all know somebody who needs to use a food bank, um, how comes we aren't really coming together and really using our resources and our energies um, to fight back on this. So I know there's great work done in North Edinburgh on, on things like this. Um, so in, in the things that we're, you know, it's, it's very worrying um, because if, uh, if you've come across Terry McAllister, I know Scotty Three did a meeting, uh, he spoke, uh, the links between direct links between government and the oil in the fossil fuel industry is completely direct. Either the fossil fuel industry people provide the CEOs become advisors to the cabinet or cabinet ministers become CEOs of the fossil fuel industry. So these last uh, few decades have proved to us that they just look after their own and they're not they don't give a damn through all of through the lock, the last two years of COVID. They don't give a damn about ordinary people. Um, and it's, I'm very, very angry about it all. Uh, and I really would like to join, have our uh, group join any uh, campaigns that we can lend ourselves to and raise awareness about things that can be done. Uh, the numbers, when, when Neil and Pete quote numbers, money, it just, it means, it has begun to mean nothing to me because whenever they want to, whenever there's a political will to do something, they find the money. They literally print money that they don't mm. have. So um, it, 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 it doesn't make sense to me that, that the poorest of, uh, of the nation will have to pay for this because if they can make the money, just make the money. Why does anyone have to owe it back? It's, this is... Um, you know, my rantings, I'm not really uh, saying anything concrete, um, but it's, and again, with the Pakistan floods, it's the worst floods uh, in the country. Uh, more, my friends are in, the, uh, my friends' families are in the Punjab, which hasn't been affected, but everybody is so aware. It's the biggest, uh, you know, thing that people are donating to um, because of this, this crisis. So we're, we're aware about the links to, um, what can I say, to cl climate crisis, linking to the misery that people are suffering in the global south. Mm. Um, we've been doing meetings and try, uh, trying to raise awareness with, uh, with all the other campaigns on this. And the cost of living is scary for people. It's a terrible time when people have worked really hard, they end up living single uh, by, by themselves and just hand to mouth. Um, a neighbor had uh, in Edinburgh had broken a leg in June. And if it wasn't for community, she would, would not be looked after. There isn't any resources for her to uh, depend on. And that it, everyone, everyone must know someone who, who needs help. And it's just, um, I really need I really need to join any group that's going to be doing anything because I'm very, very angry. And I don't, I don't swear much, uh, but yes, it's, a, it's one of those situations. But I don't feel like I'm saying anything particularly different or, or useful. Um, I'm just looking at the notes um, <laughs> Neil and uh, Pete were saying, but it's just the it's bonkers, 130 billion suddenly available and uh, they could uh, and the fixed price is absolutely what Pete's saying they could fix the prices it's not it's not it's not magic it's just sensible 
economics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I better stop there because I'm just going to send into... Um, yes. You've done perfectly as a matter of fact, Serene. You're yeah. spot on for five minutes. So thank you very much. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you. That's that's great. So um, the third speaker then is Phoebe um, from Just Stop Oil. Uh, I've lost you again, Phoebe. Oh, <laughs> you want to talk? Oh, there you are. Yes, hooray. Um, yes. So um, uh, um, over to you. Ah, boy, yeah. Thank you very much for for having me along. Um, yeah, I completely agree with with everything that has been said, and it's so really unfathomable situation that that we all find ourselves in um yeah I think what kind of struck me there what Zareen was saying is like at this point you know so many things like COVID and all these things that keep happening like we're coming together and it's community that's like it's really hard but we're getting through it and we're getting through it and I think you're right when you feel like what at what point do we say no it's not okay like the fact that all these food banks have all opened up, you know, throughout this 12 years, you know, of conservative rule and all these policies before, like, it's not okay that that's what we have to do. There should be things there to support us. And um, yeah, the, the money as well, I think. So our our campaign is very kind of, it's, it's one demands. Um, so as Neil was saying, we're like a direct action group and it's one demand that, the UK government um, commit to no new oil and gas licenses and no future projects. Um, and for us, that's that's a cut off that is really important. And you know, as Pete was saying, if we leave it to the oil and gas companies, mm -hmm. you know, it will take another 20 years if we're lucky for the kind of change and the kind of transition that we know we need to actually come around and the way we kind of look at it and the people I work with is that, you know, it's can feel like a really impossible big ask of our leaders, but we know what the solutions are. And the scientists have told us the solutions for decades. You know, if we're funding the right things, if the money is going to the right place. If it had been going to the right place two months ago, so many vulnerable homes could have been insulated. And that's just in two months. And I think fighting for that cutoff for us, that's why we've chosen that, like pushing really, really, really hard for that so that we get that win. They can't keep investing in that and they cannot keep funding oil and gas in this country. And I guess that's why it's such a big thing because we know how far they're in the pockets of these companies and how much these companies are used to their power and just being able to demand the oil prices and the energy prices in this country. Um, I think I was, it really, really hit me when, because obviously, we, as, as I think people said, we've been waiting around for a new government to actually make a decision and actually do something. And then not that we expected much. And then you just see Liz Trust stand there getting asked by the opposition, what, what, why not a windfall tax? Mm -hmm. why, not, why not implement that like, you know, many other countries? And the way she just swept it aside, she's like, no, I, I will not do that. I will not do that and it just the last kind of you know naive bit of hope within me was just like god okay we've really got it we've really got to fight for this and we really have to not let them take another inch because you know they they do not care um but I think yeah so obviously what we're doing is we've been blocking infrastructure we've been as a protest room you know, much like they did at climate camp, just seeing what is impactful, what actually pushes through that business as usual. Um, and it is difficult, but I think, I mean, what I do and my colleagues do, we, we speak to people on the street a lot. We, we kind of, we leaflet and we speak to people and that's the most important part of my job. And I think, you know, 98% people I speak to are worried obviously they're but they get it they understand the connections between you know what's why we can't pay our bills and why there's this flooding in Pakistan and why can't we just make better decisions and it's very obvious for a lot of us you know it's yeah 
Um, sorry, I'm just looking at what everything else was said. Just, just uh, yeah. One more so, minute. One yeah. or two more minutes. Yeah. No, you're doing great. <laughs> um, Very relevant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think at the moment, the knowledge that we all know what the problem is and we're all feeling it. And there's just so many movements and groups like yourselves. And um, we were at the Climate Festival in Edinburgh and we see the union striking and all this kind of stuff. There is that momentum and there is that power and that realization that we've got to give it our best, best shot. And, you know, it's difficult to be hopeful and to be empowered right now, but we've got it. We've got a good chance because the one thing I kind of know about Liz Trust right now, she doesn't know what she's doing. And if we all put all that pressure on it, she, they U-turn all the time. It's just whether they will do the right, whether we can get them to do it in time. Um, but yeah, it's it great to see you all here and thanks for all your brilliant expertise and words and I've run it all down and I'll be, <laughs> um, yeah, it's invaluable stuff like this. So thank you very much for having us.